You mentioned the data I shared on uh, online sentiment analysis. I chose Twitter because it's one way of getting data to show, show what's happening, but it's also not just Twitter. From July 2022, there has been a huge upsurge in what I think looks like a new kind of, it's not climate denialism, it's anti-climate action. And yeah, it's early days, so I can't say for certain why that's happening. Another climate emergency forum and we're doing this one live at Sharm El Sheikh Egypt for the uh, COP27 conference. I'm Paul Beckwith and I'm going to be having a chat with Dr. Jem Bendel. Yeah thank you for the uh, invitation it's good to finally meet you as well having seen quite a lot of your videos. Likewise too it's uh, you've been doing some incredible work which has got widespread coverage I think widespread interest especially the ideas of deep adaptation which is uh, I think that was a fairly new idea to a lot of people when you first came out with those ideas so can you tell us a little bit about sort of the background what made you think along those lines originally? Yeah I told someone in a meeting today that I first started working on sustainable development and climate change in 1995 and he said, oh, before I was born. So, um, so yeah, a while. And uh, I was inspired by the Rio Earth Summit in 92. I thought, oh, wow, I don't only have to aspire to be in a Greenpeace dinghy. I can actually maybe have a career in sustainability as it was becoming called. So that really was my journey until, um, until 2016 when it was at a point when the news I was reading about in terms of current impacts, glacier retreat, permafrost melting, that kind of thing, was the kind of stuff that when I studied climatology at Cambridge in 1993, I thought in a bad case scenario, I might start seeing that in my 70s. That was kind of, and therefore I started to doubt the mainstream. I started to doubt what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had been telling me. I started to look at climate science again for myself for the first time in, in, in years and it, I was shocked at what I found about the methodology used, about the need for consensus in a way which therefore would exclude things that were actually really important. Often some of the outlier results are the ones that are pointing to unprecedented and rapid changes. And as I sunk more and more into that, yeah, by 2018, I concluded that all the work I'd been doing was pointless. I'd been working in a paradigm of in incremental reform of capitalism. Um, and then yeah, and then I just realized we, we don't have time for that. We're already in an emergency situation and I could, not long, could no longer continue the work I was doing. What I realized though is I couldn't just quit. I, I had, had built a reputation, I'd become a professor, I had a following in corporate sustainability. I wanted to let people know what I thought I had found out. So I published a, well, I s submitted a paper to a journal. It was rejected because of its conclusions. Which basically one of the reviewers said, well, you can't conclude it's too late. It was all in generic terms. I, I was concluding it's too late for society as we know it, industrial consumer societies, that they would break down because of direct and indirect impacts of climate change. And well, I thought, well, I can't change that. That's the main reason why I want to share this analysis. It's only my view. You know, we can all speculate on the future. I'm simply extrapolating from what I'm seeing. My my university published it instead, and then it went viral, a million downloads, and deep adaptation as a thing therefore took off. And I then focused on trying to help create uh, an online network so people could meet each other and talk about these this way of seeing the the situation in the future. Yes, uh, thank you for that. And. Uh it seems that climate, uh, I mean, we're definitely undergoing abrupt climate system change. It's always, things are always surprising and much faster than scientists expected. You know, I, I, that was a very interesting um, plot that you showed earlier where you showed the um, climate justice hashtag usage over the last two years and compared it to climate scam. 
And in the last four months, as you showed, the climate scam hashtag has you know, just accelerated and took off and such that now it's about two and a half times uh, higher than climate justice. Do you know if there was some specific incidents, do you think, that, that may have triggered that huge shift? Um, I mean, one of the things um, with new ownership of Twitter, the whole um, platform is in, in flux and people are very uncertain as to uh, what, what it will end up as. And, uh, you know, we've just gone through the, the U.S. midterms and it just it just seems that, you know, as climate disruption worsens, the consequences worsen, you know, the climate system breaks down, it seems that society is doing it just as faster, faster. It, we're, it's like we're in a dystopian world in a way. I don't know, this is how I feel, like it's just all, it, it's, it seems like uh, everything's accelerating, you know, exponential growth you know the climate whether you look at global temperatures or destruction of um, reefs coral reefs or amazon rainforest whatever whatever you look at things are accelerating and getting worse and worse and eventually you know i mean we're starting to break a lot of things on the planet and we're getting all of these cascading feedbacks where one thing breaks it causes another thing to break and you know one of the things i followed for years is the uh, sea ice and the uh, collapse of the glaciers on on greenland and antarctica and those are all definitely accelerating we're going to have a world soon with no sea ice in in summers and you know at least the science papers are starting to get a bit closer to the truth but they're always laggards they're always slow and scientists are always still reticent so wh what can we do i mean i think we're going to have this collapse and then we're going to try to pick up the pieces that's what i think the way we're heading well there's a lot in that <laughs> yeah i, I want to rewind slightly you mentioned the data i shared on uh, online sentiment analysis i chose twitter because it's one way of getting data to show, show what's happening, but it's also not just Twitter. From July 2022, there has been a huge upsurge in what I think looks like a new kind of, it's not climate denialism, it's anti-climate it's anti -climate action. And yeah, it's early days, so I can't say for certain why that's happening. And I think it's, but what the analysis is that it's not bots. This isn't just some sort of plan by someone. This is actually reflective of a segment of society that is rebelling against uh, what we believe here at the, this climate conference is pretty obvious now. Mm -hmm. And we're just debating about how bad, how fast and what to do about it. So my, uh, propose, my suggestion, my argument is that people are responding to the way they are beginning to experience the climate issue conveyed to them and the way that, uh, who's involved. So basically they're beginning to see it as global corporations and authoritarian governments starting to talk about and profit from the, cl their, the, the climate crisis. So they look at, say, the Inflation Reduction Act and they see a massive amount of spend on certain companies and they think, hold on, what's all this about? And so if people associate climate action with these kind of things, rather than their own lives and, dam and the damage to their own lives and also what's happening around the world, and if they, if they don't see that actually a breakdown in our climate is the result of, I believe it's the system of globalized capitalism, which is forcing us all to compete with each other and destroy nature and, and drive this in infinite growth um, system that we have. So. I think this is the problem. It's becoming seen as a technocratic um, uh, thing. Uh, or, and, and, and when I talk to people, I, I know environmental, I know people who used to believe in climate change and now they're rebelling against action on climate change. And they're talking about it as a ploy to control them or uh, a, a way that uh, corporations are try, trying to make money out of this disaster. And I say, well, yeah, but you know it's real, don't you? <laughs> so what? You know, let, let's talk about a more bottom-up, democratic, participatory response to this crisis. So um, that's what I'm trying to invite here. And I concluded my speech by saying the whole story around climate is being dominated by elites now. And that's counterproductive. It's going to lead to a backlash. It's going to lead to lead to bad policies. We need to reach out to particularly to activists in the global south to help them educate people about why their weather is changing, why their lives are becoming more difficult, what's to come what's at fault and therefore also who's to blame 
and then support them to work out for themselves how they wish to mobilize politically on that. And that will be uncomfortable for us in the West. It will mean that more political leaders emerge from the global south who don't just request nicely at conferences like this that we pay a bit more from the rich world. They will organize together to make sure the West degrows. And this is going to happen. Some people would describe this as breakdown. Some people would say, oh, that's protectionism, whatever. I don't think so. I think it's only fair. <laughs> so it's interesting that, yes, we're in a very strange time. Things are unraveling. But we've also got to be careful that we're not attached to ways of living and ways of thinking we're actually, which are actually part of the problem. Yes, thank you. So, I mean, this COP27, everybody's talking about loss and damages, loss and damages. And that concept has been around for a long time. The idea that the climate change problem is mostly from rich industrialized developed countries whereas the undeveloped say less developed countries etc are just bearing the brunt the brunt of the problem and that they did not cause so that's the whole idea of loss and damage that there's money transferred to help these uh, poor countries stay uh, solvent, stay on their feet and, and cope with these things. So the U.S. and other countries have, have been completely opposed to loss and damage up to now. But I think the damages are getting so bad. Just look at what happened in Pakistan this summer that it's, it's really hard, almost impossible for them to completely ignore the problem now. So at least they're going to talk about it this conference. But yeah, it, I mean, we, we've hit this planet with a massive hammer for so hard for so long. You know, we're suffering the consequences now. We need, we need to completely change the way we do things in order to stay on this planet, survive as a species long term. So it's actually quite frightening how rapidly the climate situation is degrading. And I, I see abrupt rapid climate change actually contributing to the turn politically to, you know, authoritarian governments, to right-wing governments, because people, you know, some people are very scared of this yet without acknowledging it. And so they instinctively w want to go to strong arm governments who will tell them what to do and how to do it. And they don't have to think for themselves. So it's, it's like one of these feedbacks between human politics and, and the climate system. So yeah, the, the thing that we don't hear in the media much at all or hear um, from s presentations at COP27 is the uh, the surveys that have been done the last few years in so many countries around the world big big proportions of people now do not believe the future is a good one one study found that for example 50 percent of people in india that uh, it was a big survey believe that they'll see the collapse of society in their lifetime so there's been a massive change and of course <laughs> you'd rerun that survey now in in pakistan what are they experiencing right now so yeah it, it, w what i believe is that there's a reason why talking about that reality of a breakdown of industrial consumer societies and other societies uh, less less urbanized um yeah, there's a reason why it's taboo in mainstream media and from politicians. Uh, because their whole power and prestige, their identity, their worldview, everything is all dependent on it. And that you were talking about it. Anxiety, absolutely. So climate change is triggering death anxiety, basically. And psychologists have looked at it and said that when you're feeling more at threat, there's something that kicks in called worldview defense. And when psychologists have analyzed this before, they've been looking at mainly non-Western cultures and how people might become more sort of religious in a traditional fundamentalist way but i think it's actually happening in the west and people are turning to sort of they're either turning to whatever it is it might be nativist views and uh, populist views it might be uh, xenophobic views but also i think there's some rather weird worldview defense of people who believe in modernity i don't see all that much logic from people who are <laughs> it's almost like for example i'll give you an example in my field, corporate sustainability, uh, which I've now left, people used to always talk about the business case for why you should lead on climate change and it's good for your business. They don't say that anymore. The way they, 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 they talk about we must hope and we must have faith, it's some sort of quasi-religious demand, otherwise be damned. I mean, it's, it, there is some weird things going on in the way people are talking now. And then I get the aggression as a result because I'm saying, well, no, I believe in doing things not because of 
it's necessarily going to work. I believe in doing things because they're good to do, they're right to do. I believe in truth. I believe holding power to account. I believe in in uh, being open-minded and open-hearted. And um, so the idea that we do something just because it's going to work at scale it is not, for me, the the whole answer. So this is a very um, obviously a very difficult field to be engaged in for you and I and many other people that you know understand how dire climate change is so one of the ways that um, you know I stay on an even keel or relatively even keel is I have my cat Shackleton who I include in many of my climate videos and I have a puppy uh, Newton who I miss terribly uh, at the conf being at the conference and I'll, I'll have to uh, you know I do occasional FaceTimes with him not to mention my spouse and kids but I'm mentioning the pets so I you know this is uh, I find them sort of very um, relaxing to be spend be with them and care for them and that's one of the ways i think that i cope with the negativity of all of this uh climate chaos and destruction so how about yourself what do you do so i've had a complete cat conversion i think i remember when i first saw your videos i thought why has he got his cat and then what happened was i was at a buddhist temple where i go and the nun normally looks after the cats but she was away for two months. So the cleaners were just feeding the, the adult cats. Well, there was this tiny straggly black cat, which was just meowing the whole time. I couldn't, I decided to sod this meditation stuff. I'll just go to the nun's office and check him out how he is. And he had diarrhea and they weren't looking after him. So I ended up adopting him and that was a year ago. And um, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. <laughs> I'm now it's been a joy. It means that me sitting at home on my laptop the whole time is less annoying or lonely. So I'm missing him now being away for quite a while. So I can see why here in Egypt, in ancient times, they used to worship cats. And obviously with us being here, they now worship cats again. Would that be true? Yeah. So, but and not, not more seriously, as seriously, how I cope is I have a life outside all of this, which is more to do with well, which is musical and spiritual and I keep it quite separate for example I, I co-led my first kirtan circle just a few weeks ago so yeah it's all I keep it all very separate and that helps compartmentalization I think is a term that uh, that people use you know you, you need to separate your work you can't be doing your work 24 7 and and maintain an even keel so before i before i started the videos and before i got into a lot of my work i used to talk about climate change all the time with my kids and my spouse and they got kind of sick of it but you know as i delved into the research and the videos and going to conference etc now i hardly talk about it at all with them and i think they're very thankful for that <laughs> for that aspect so what would you say that your uh, your objectives are say for the next year or so i mean if we do this talk in a year at another cop what do you, what sort of projects do you have on the go at the moment well i think for me the biggest conclusion is everyone at home keep watching paul's videos so he doesn't have to t upset his family talking about climate change your question was what am i going to be doing next year so what I'm what I'm finishing is is a book which is going to be trying to provide a basis for a post progress progressive politics because so many people of the the center and the left and the radical left of politics are not really engaged in reality which is that industrial civilization is beginning to break down and so what we have is all these populists who've come along since 2015 saying let's turn back the clock and the left and the center just never want to talk like that but people are intuiting what reality is as we said earlier the opinion polls show it too and so the only people meeting that meeting them where they're at are these reactionary populists who don't have anything to offer so i'm very interested in what could be, you know, I called it what, a post-progress progressive politics. Recognizing things are going to become more difficult, break apart. We can't pretend that it's just about including more people in you know, a utopian capitalist future. Uh, we're working now on lesser dystopias and there's a massive conversation to be had there and there'll be multiple ideas. There are many ideas already, but I don't think there's a framework for people to be able to identify them and talk to each other about them, support each other. So not a small task for my book. That's why it's taken so long. So apart from that, um, I hope more music. I might actually try and make the connection 
uh, as well because music for me and writing music as well is a way of uh, allowing difficult emotions and and transmuting them into beauty you may disagree when you hear my music but um, <laughs> but for me that's how it is so for me yeah the book and more music and uh no i don't really ever want to come to any cop or anything like it ever again well thank you very much uh jem and uh thank you to all our listeners uh you know on climate emergency forum and i also want to uh remember uh stuart scott who who uh passed away last year and he was responsible you know big part of starting all of all of this work with these these groups so thanks again and uh until next time bye for now Thank you.